Educate, entertain, enjoy. You're listening to Aspen Weight Radio. Okay, this is um, Aspen Weight Media production, and today Paul Weight meets Graham Bradley. Good morning, Graham. Good morning, Paul. Nice to meet you. Uh, Graham is um, joining us from his new Jeet. In how long have you been in um, the Jeet now? Uh, last December we moved in. So uh, near La Rochelle. It's France. We're not in the Jeet. We're in a lovely house, and we've uh, built a Jeet next door. Uh, and we're we're employing people to come. Um, obviously, the COVID nineteen has been a little bit of a problem, but there's lots of friends that are going to come. Um, it's a really, really, really nice area. The wood, the weather's lovely. Mm-hmm. So, we're, we're, so we're really looking forward to it. Nice rugby team down the road. Do you like rugby no, at all? No, um, I used to like rugby in England, mm. but I was more more of a Leeds United football supporter. You four two, Leeds. four two. Yeah, I watched it yesterday. That was very disappointing. <laughs> um, but, but I, I, you know, I was, I was, a, I was a mad keen Leeds United supporter. Yeah, no, no, I played a fair bit of golf. I won four British Masters Pro Ams, um, mm. but I wasn't, you know, I didn't do much about rugby. Okay. Well, let's go back to the beginning. So, um, have to declare an interest. Uh, let's, let's see if Graham blushes now. Um, so, Graham um, has been a quite an important part of my life for uh, 41 years, I think it is now. Um, huh. So, um, uh, for better or worse, Graham was my favourite jockey of all time. Um, so, Graham rode uh, as a national hunt jockey from 1978 till 1999, I think it was. Um, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was about 2000 when I retired, 22 years ago. Um, I rode a Cheltenham Gold Cup winner, Brigon. Yeah, don't, don't you go years. nick all my thunder now, going on ahead now, Graham. Or you're going to smack. years ago, yeah. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. <laughs> so um, you were born to um, a racing father, but in a council estate in Weatherby. So that seems a bit of an odd mix to me. Yeah, Weatherby High Street. Um, my father, Norman, unfortunately, we lost him when he was 72. But he worked for lots of people around the Weatherby area. And he worked for Jack Hansen. And then he started training. Um, I think he had a runner in the derby, Silvalgo. Mm. Um, finished three quarters of the way behind, but he was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. He had loads of he had loads of winners on the flat and over jumps. Um, who was his main main Tommy Stack? Oh yeah, rode, rode that's in Red Rum. Yep, he was a superstar, <laughs> Tommy Stack. He still is a superstar, and his son who's training now is a Foz is, is brilliant. Do you still go over to Ireland much? Um, I used to go to Ireland a lot. I rode a lot of winners yeah, in Ireland. Did, yeah, they um, did, I used to absolutely love it. I haven't been for a while yet, unfortunately. Yeah, I think your personality suits Ireland, actually, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah, but it's just, you know, the COVID has been a nightmare for everybody for <laughs> yeah. two years, and you? you're yeah. not allowed to go anywhere. It's, it's, it's been really disappointing for everybody. So um, where, where, did, you, did you start riding from a very early age? Um, yes, I was sort of like six or seven or eight years old. Um, started learning. My dad started teaching me. I wanted to be a flat jockey. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, which was which was absolutely amazing. Um, I went down to Newmarket. Um, I went to Midlam. Um, I rode work with Lester Piggott. Yeah, um, it was absolutely amazing. But unfortunately. I got a little bit heavy. Um, I got over to nine stone seven. I was an amateur jockey for six months, I think. Um, I rode at Redcar, my first ever ride when I was 16. <laughs> but unfor- unfortunately, I got too heavy. Um, and then I started started being a jump jockey at um, Arthur Stevenson's. Mm. It seems a bit odd to me. You so in your book, you talk about how much you sort of hero worship Lester Piggott, and you tried really hard to get Lester the ride on one of your dad's horses, I think, and jock off another jockey, which um, I'm, I'm not, I'm never particularly like, and it's one of the things I don't like about Lester Piggott. Um, it just seems to me that you and Lester Piggott are like chalk and cheese because he, you know, if you take um, the infamous ride on the Minstrel in the Derby, you know, when he beat um, Hot Grove by a short head, Lester Piggott. Oh you know, hit um, the minstrel repeatedly for about a furlong, he would have probably lost the race today. Uh, I just find it um, interesting that you would like Lester Piggott when he, 
you know, you're a very stylish sort of look after the horse type jockey. Yeah, but I was always a massive, massive, <laughs> massive fan. I still am a fan, still a friend of Lester Piggott. All right. Um, and his daughter. I thought he was an absolute genius. Um, and my dad liked him as well. My dad wanted Jack Hansen to to ride Silvalgo in a, in, a, in, a, in a famous race. But he, um, I think Walter Bentley was <laughs> only, only weighed about seven stone, I think. He put him on him instead. But I just thought, I think Lester Piggott was one of the best jockeys that, um, that I've ever I've ever seen, ever known. I think he's a, an absolute genius. It's interesting, you know, I watched uh, an old YouTube clip of Sea Pigeon um, when he was 12 running on uh, the flat last night and um, Lester Piggott actually rode him. And it was probably the worst worst um, race Sea Pigeon ever, ever ran. So he was... Um, I think he was something like twelfth out of sixteen. Oh, I can't remember that at all. No, Sea yeah. Pigeon was a brilliant horse. I think one of the one of the best races I ever seen ever in my life was John Franken winning yeah. the champion hurdle on him. It, he was an absolute genius. He, again, he's a still a very close friend of mine. Hopefully, he's going to come here and see me in France. John Franken. We play a lot of golf with him. He's a legend. <laughs> well, one of the things I like about John Franken is he's got a proper West Country accent. Yes, <laughs> don't you think? Well, he was. All, I don't know. He was always in the uh, the Lambourne area, I think, and all his family's in the Lambourne. Oh, he's got area, a real. So. He comes from Wiltshire, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but he he started riding with no saddles and things. He told me, absolute genius. But it's his hands, his balance, his rhythm, his time, and he was he was he was just unbelievable. I I learned a lot of him. I really did. Yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, you're quite similar. Um, one thing I was going to ask you: you've got a very distinctive riding style. Um, I'm not a great rider myself, but you, um, you're, you're very much um, pushing the horse forward, I think, when, when you watch you riding. Where did you get that style from? Who taught you to ride like that? Uh, I more or less did it myself, I think. My dad helped me a little bit. But I wanted to be a flat jockey. Um, and I was always, always with my head and my back, I was always very level, very balanced. My hands was always very soft <laughs> on a horse's mouth. And um, my balance, balance, sorry, balance, rhythm, timing was all very, very, very slow. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, ne I never hit a horse's a lot and hard. I did once on Wayward Lad at Cheltenham, unfortunately. He was a very, very, very lazy horse. But apart from that, I never did. I only used to hit him two or three times. But, but listen, balance, rhythm, timing, looking after him. Another thing I didn't used to do, and a lot of really, really, really good jockeys don't do it now, is move your legs, kick your legs, 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 legs. I used to just sit still like a flat jockey um, and just use my balance. Mm. Um, and I think it was, you know, just to keep a horse balanced is very, very, very important. So um, you, I think you were first apprentice to Arthur Stevenson, and then, of course, you moved oh. to the Dickinson stable. Um, and I was thinking about this this morning, actually. Um, if it wasn't for the Dickinsons, then, you, you know, I wouldn't, you wouldn't be my, um, one of my heroes. Um, so just to, you know, Gay Spartan, for instance, was my favourite horse when I was, um, he won the, the King horse. George um, the year before Silver Buck did, I think, um, with Tommy Comedy riding. Um, he was a funny jockey, wasn't he? Very um, non-typical of the Dickinsons, I would say. Yeah, he rode, he rode a lot of winners. I mean, when I was young, um, I was riding for a bloke called Tommy Shedden in Weatherby. I was getting a pound on a Saturday, 50p on a Sunday. Uh, he was an absolute superstar. He was very old. And Tommy Stack was riding for him, and it was him who told me to go to Arthur Stevenson, right, when I was about 17. Um, but when I went to Arthur Stevenson's, which was absolutely unbelievable, he had three big stables. He had a lot of horses. He had a lot of winners. Um, he did have a few flat winners, but mo most of them were jump winners. Um, but Arthur Stevenson never used to go out during the day to watch his horses canter. Um, so he never used to see me, and he, and he, mm -hmm. he, wasn't, a, he wasn't a big fan of me, unfortunately. Mm. I was there for... Well, fortunately, I was there for, maybe. I was there for two <laughs> years. Um but then I was told um, to go to Tony Dickinson's, right, when he moved from his yard yeah, yeah. to... to um, was he Harewood, was he? 
Harewood, that's right. Harewood, yes. You know, in between, in between Harrogate and Leeds. And my dad knew him. wasn't a very, very close friend of him, but he, but he knew him. Um, and he had about twelve or thirteen jockeys, right? Yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, but Tommy Shedden was 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 absolutely brilliant. And he said to me, "Yeah, your son can come and work for us. He's a jockey. Um, he's not going to get many rides for us." He says, "But he can come um, and and work for us, and we'll look after him." And you won't believe it, in a million years, within four months, they see me ride every day and they thought I was very good. Um, and they put me on a horse called Talon. Oh, yeah, it was a good horse, yeah. At, at Sedgefield. Mm. It was on the, it was in the Gold it was a Cheltenham, Cheltenham week. Um, and I rode my first winner for him and it set me off and it was, it was, you know, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, I, I loved it. It was mega. So how many years did you ride for Tony? Just a couple, was it? I don't think it was even a two years. I think it was only a year. I think he he retired, and Michael Dickinson took over. In I think it was about nineteen eighty two. Um, didn't no Michael should, trained Bragorn, didn't he? So uh, yeah, yeah. There I, you should, go. I should have a look. At, I, should, I, should, I should have a look at my book and let me have a look what time. Here we go. Nineteen seventy nine. Um, no, sorry, it was 20th of February 1980, Talon, finished third for Tony Dickinson. There you go. And then yeah. Sedgefield, I won on him, 1980 in March. Then I was, I rode him at Chepstow. Then I rode a winner from Mick Easterby, Tony Dickinson. I was a, oh, I was a stable lad. <laughs> a stable <laughs> lad for Michael Dickinson and all them, right? <laughs> um, Ian Watkinson, I led up Ian Watkinson, Richard Collins, Ridley Lamb, Robert Earnshaw, Thomas Tate, Tommy Carmody. Tommy, yeah, Tommy Dunn, Tate Tommy is Monica, is the Dickinson's yeah. son-in-law, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. But then <laughs> here we go. Where was it? There we go. We started October the 6th, 1980. I had my first ride for Michael Dickinson. Yeah, I thought it was and really I won on, I won on a horse called Happy Hector. Um, I mean, he was an absolute superstar. Was Michael Dickinson? He was. It was a. It was a miracle to, to ride winners for him. And I was um, not champion jockey that year. Sorry, junior champion jockey. 1981-82, I had 32 winners for Michael Dickinson, mm. which was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, he was. Um, he was almost like OCD. Do you think? Sort of very obsessive sort of person. Or was that unfair? Well, um, his, his dad was still helping him. Um, his mother Monica was absolutely brilliant as well. Yeah. She did a load of the feeding and stuff. Yeah. But Michael was a he was an alcoholic. I'm sorry, not alcoholic, a workaholic. <laughs> he just he just kept he just kept you know he was he wasn't he wasn't a drinker. Sorry, at Michael. All. <laughs> yes, no, he was just a worker, worker, worker. Um, he only had a, he only had a small old car. He never used to spend loads and loads of money. He was just he was just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant worker with everything to do with horses. I mean, he was an absolute genius. So breakthrough really was Bragorn, I guess, got you into the big big time. Uh, how did you get to get the ride in the eighty one Gold Cup? Um, well, I think it was the nineteen eighty two. Um, oh, it was the nineteen eighty one Cheltenham Gold Cup. Yeah, he came second um, in eighty one. Let me have a look. 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 Nineteen eighty-one. Nineteen eighty-one. Second in the Gold Cup, um, and then I won the, the Hennessy on him. You did the following year at Newbury, and then I won the Cheltenham Gold Cup on him in nineteen eighty-three. I was born in nineteen sixty. I was twenty-two years old when Michael Dickinson had the first five. It was, and I was favourite. It was, it, was, it was just absolutely amazing, brilliant horse, um, and I was very lucky to to get the ride on him. Of um, Wayward Lad, Silver Buck, and Bragorn, which do you actually think was the better horse? Um, Silver Buck was an absolute superstar. Unfortunately, he got injured and, and we lost him eventually. Um, Bragorn was a bit temperamental when you rode him out; he used to stop, and it was funny at the start of races. But Wayward Lad won three King Georges and he won loads and loads of races. I think Wayward Lad was probably the best horse I ever rode. Really? That's saying something, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I rode a, I rode a lot of very, very good horses. I was very lucky. I rode a lot of very good trainers. Um, it was just a, a bit of a disaster when Michael Dickinson had won the Gold Cup 
um, and he was young, um, and he got offered that job by Robert Sangster. Yeah, that's right. Manton House Stables, and he offered the job, and he went. So I stayed with his mother, Monica Dickinson, for about three years, I think. Mm. She was getting very old, but she stayed there, and I rode um, – where would lad won the King George? I rode loads of winners for it. It was absolutely brilliant. But I'm telling you now, it would have been a real shame if Michael Dickinson would have stayed training jump horses mm. um, at Harewood. I would probably have been champion jockey then. Um, no, I think you're right. I'd got to the top of the to, I'd got to the top of the list, and I was probably the you know the main stable jockey there. But still, I rode for a lot of I rode for a lot of nice people. I rode for a lot of good horses. I won a lot of big races. Um, I was like a bit shame I wasn't a champion jockey, wasn't it? <laughs> I better be a champion chap, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, tell me, you know, if you uh, I'm sorry to be mischievous. Um, I get the feeling you never really got on with Robert Earnshaw, who was the regular rider of Silver Buck. Um, he seemed to be a bit jealous of you. Um, is that is that fair? Robert, or? Robert, I think he was. I mean, he was a he was a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful horseman over a fence. He wasn't brilliant in a finish, mind. But unfortunately, I had a fallout with his wife um, when I won the Hennessy on Brigon, and he was second. I nearly fell. I mean, it's in my book. I nearly fell at the last, and I got three or four lengths behind him, but I got back up and won him mm. anyway. On the way home in the car, he was driving, his wife was in the front, I was in the back, and it came up on the radio talking about the Hennessy, mm. and she turned it off and put something on, which was which really, really, really upset me. I never said anything. I just I just leant back and went to sleep. But it was just an awful thing to do. And I ended up falling out with his missus and having a little fallout with him. I never really got on with him. I mean... He was, a, he was a nice lad. He was a brilliant jockey. He's just been retired now a few months ago, you know, the jockey club with a BHA, sorry. Yes. Um, but sorry about sorry, sorry about saying that, but it was a true story and it was in my book, so I had to say it. She was, she was obviously upset that I'd beaten her, her husband <laughs> in the Hennessy Gold Cup. Yeah, one of the things that was interesting about the Dickinsons, I, I mean, not necessarily good interesting, is um, I don't really understand why... Um, some of their, they sort of spread the rides around their great horses. So Badsworth Boy, for instance, was ridden by Kevin White, wasn't he? Um, so you, it's very unusual for a, these days, you know, you wouldn't get Nicky Henderson putting up, you know, four different jockeys across the stable, would you? Well, there was about seven or eight jockeys there and uh, Robert Earnshaw did win three, three races at Cheltenham on him, the Queen Mother Champion Chase. So he rode him a loss, but... I rode, I rode him at Weatherby. Mm, Castleford. The, um, I can't remember what the name of Castleford, yeah, the Chase. Castleford Chase. Well yeah. done. Yeah, I rode <laughs> him a couple of times. Yeah, so I mean, I, I rode him over hurdles to start with, and I didn't win many. I don't think I rode a winner for him over hurdles. But when I rode him over fences in the Castleford Chase at Weatherby, that was brilliant. That was on, I think, all the other jockeys, Robert Earnshaw rode King George. At Kempton, so I rode him at Weatherby. He was a very, very, very good. So I was lucky to ride him, but I didn't ride him a lot, unfortunately. But Robert Earnshaw did ride him a fair bit. He was a, he was a very, very, very good horse. How did um, Jamie Osborne get to meet the Dickinsons? Because he he t he he rode a horse called Raise an Argument, I think, in one of the big races. And I always remember as as a, as a Graham Bradley fan, uh, there was a there was a quote in the sporting pages in the Daily Express saying, Graham Bradley says, don't forget me, I'm still as good as ever. What was that all about? Can you remember that? Well, that must have been later in my career, I think, because Jamie Osborne um, was a fair bit younger than me, and he did ride for Monica Dickinson at the... Um, That's right. Not, not the end of her career, but at the end of her training mm. career, I think, yes. Um, I never had a fallout with Jamie. Jamie was a friend. He, he, was, he was, used to live near Weatherby. It was oh, okay. a very, 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 very good jockey. Um, very good jockey. Yeah, you're, um, it's quite funny, you know, I, I don't know if you believe in fate. Um, I'm a great believer that certain people are meant to meet each other. And uh, I think there's a recurring theme for your career with you and Jamie Osborne, which obviously um, reached its height with um, Senor Albertruzzi and, and Collier Bay in the champion hurdle.
Yeah, Senior Albertruti. Unfortunately, um, I couldn't ride Senior Albertruti because it had 10 stone at Cheltenham in that big chase. Um, well, he's and been he got the there, ride yeah. on it. I rode a few winners um, on Senior Albertruti, but well, then I couldn't do the weight. So, um, you know, I, I, used to, I used to struggle a little bit to do 10 3, 10 4, 10 5. I think I did, I think I did ten stone once on um, couldn't be better, and then I won the Thiestis chase and couldn't be better uh, for Charlie Brooks later on. Mm. Anyway, so I couldn't ride it at Cheltenham, but then unfortunately Jamie Osborne broke something his arm or That's his right. leg his arm, or his yeah. neck or something like that. So I got the ride back, um, and I won a big race at Cheltenham on him the following year, which was which was absolutely brilliant, and I kept riding him for a fair bit. Um, yeah, funny enough, I watched that very, race on very, Saturday. Very good. Did you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he used to be trained. Um, he used to be trained. Was it David Murray Smith or? No, Senior Bell was was at... Susan Nock. He started out with Charlie Brooks, ah, and then Susan, Susan Nock, Nock, the owners, trained it. She, that's right, Charlie yeah. Brooks, and then he went on to <laughs> Susan Nock. I mean, she was. I, I used to go and ride him out a fair bit and school him. He was a very good horse. I rode quite a few winners on him. No, he's a, he was one of my favourite horses, actually. Um, so going back to the, yeah. the, the Dickinsons, um, how did you how did you get to meet David Murray Smith? How did that all come about? Um, well, it's when um, when Michael went down to Robert Sangster's at Manton House, um, and I carried on riding for Monica Dickinson. She more or less retired, so I had to find a good job, mm. and he just he just rung me up, David Murray Smith. Which was which was which was absolutely amazing down in Lambourne, mm. which is three hours away from Weatherby. I'd, I'd, I'd stayed in John Frankham's house one day when I won the Hennessy on Brigon. I rode the day before because John Frankham had rode Brigon before he'd won on him at Doncaster. Oh, really? But, but anyway, when I got when I got to um, David Murray Smith's, he had the you know one of the best horses uh, that I ever rode, Rhyme and Reason. That's right. Um, I think I'd won a, I think I'd won a novice hurdle on that mm. um, for, for Michael Dickinson That's years right. and years and years ago. Uh, I've got a photograph of it in my book. But anyway, when I got on Rhyme and Reason, I won a few races on him. Um, and it was April 1985, I think. He was a novice. That's right. Uh, no, novice chaser, novice chaser. Um, and I rode him at Fairy House and, um, Juliet Reed, who's a very close friend of mine. I mean, I used to go to school with a chap called Carl Leaf. His nickname was Silas, right? <laughs> um, and I introduced him to Juliet Reed, and they've been together for years and years and years now. But anyway, I got the ride on him. Um, and April 1985, Fairy House, winning the Irish Grand National. It was the first English trainer to win the Irish Grand National for a lot of years. 1928. And he was, and he was a novice. It was 1985, <laughs> but it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant horse. And it was absolutely cool. Um, and I rode um, quite a few winners for David Murray Smith. Um, and, I, and, I, and I stayed in Lambourne for 32 years, I think it was. Quite enjoyed it. Were you stable jockey for Toby Balding? Was that, was that what happened after the David Murray Smith thing? I got a ride on a horse called Pearly Man. John Edwards. That's right. He, won the he was Daniel, a superstar yeah. horse, was, mm. was, was Pearly Man. Yeah. Um, I rode for David Ellsworth a little bit. I won the Ascot Long Walk Hurdle on in 1990. But then I rode for Toby Baldwin. Um, I did get the more or less stable job for him. I used to be, still live up in Weatherby. Mm. And I used to drive down all the time. Gosh. Um, and he got, given, he got given a horse called Kill Dymo. That's right which was just absolutely amazing. Um, and I won the Sun Alliance, novice chaser in 1987. Paul Nichols, the legend, was second on his play horse. school. But it, play school, absolutely, yeah, yeah well remembered. Um, but Toby Baldwin was was absolutely brilliant to, to ride for. It was, a, it was a miracle. I used to love driving down. It was a long, long way to go, but... I used to drive up and down, up and down, and rode a load of nice horses. But he was, he was a superstar. Yeah, Kill Dymo was my favourite horse at the time. Um, the Sun Alliance Chase he won was a really hot race, wasn't it? Because I think Mister Frisk was in that race as well. Yep, yep. Um, a very good horse. Oh, Cavi's Clown. Couldn't be better. Cavi's Clown. 
Yeah. Travis Clown, he fell at the third last or something, yeah. but it was a really hot race. The favourite fell at halfway, I think. Uh, but to win the Sun Alliance like him, I mean, he was a very, very, very strong horse. I think I won on hurdles with him the year before, but I dropped him out last, a long way last to settle him. And I went for a full circuit round at the back. And I just crept, took, crept, took, crept up. It was one of the best rides I ever gave a horse, I think. But, um, I was very pleased with what I did. <laughs> yeah, I watched a race. Sorry, sad man that I am. I watched a, a Kill Dymo race uh, last week, which I, I don't remember. It was a three-horse race. Jim, I think it was a Jim Ford at Wing Canton. And it we'll talk about a field. Burrow Hill Lad, Desert Orchid, and Kill Dymo. Those were the three runners. Ah, Yes. And, and Kill Dymo won, obviously. Yes, I've seen is, that um, on the television. It was an absolutely unbelievable race. When it made him favourite for the Grand, for the for the Gold Cheltenham Gold yeah. Cup. Um, to give him a ride like that and beat them good horses was absolutely amazing. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant race. I gave it a brilliant ride, um, and very, very, very pleased. The the race I remember um, of yours when you rode for Toby Balding was on a horse called South Parade, um, which I think it was in the finale hurdle at Chepstow. Um, so, I can remember so, watching. I was sitting yeah, with my yeah. dad watching the race. Um, my dad, my dad is um, eighty-seven, and he still has a bet every Sunday. Uh, so I go, I go to his house on yeah. a Sunday, and uh, I say, hey, "How'd you get old yesterday, Dad?" And he gets his betting slips out, and he shows me. Um, so um, yeah, we, we we both missed uh, Dickinson retiring because uh, uh, I used to go down the, the betting shop on a Saturday and do three two-pound doubles, and always do all of Michael's horses. And um, you know, he would quite often get like five or six winners across the card. Yeah. So when I when I rode for, for Monica Dickinson, I rode a can you remember this horse? A very, very, very good horse called By the Way. Oh, of course. Uh, that was some um, Christina Feathers daughter or something. No. Yeah. I rode a winner for yeah. him at Kelso, I think. And then on the eighth of March, nineteen eighty eight, I rode him at Sedgefield. And he was favourite. And we jumped, we jumped the last fence, which is right at the top of the hill at Sedgefield. They've changed it now, and there's one at the bottom of the hill. Unfortunately, it broke its leg. Oh, yeah, absolute, yeah. Absolute, oh, absolute nightmare. It was favourite for the, the Grand, for the National, Grand yeah. National. You can imagine if I'd have rode that in the Grand National, it would probably have won. Um, and for Monica Dickinson and the owner, they were both walking towards it and it was going to be shot. So I walked down and stopped them to go and see. They didn't want to go and see it. It was a, it was a, an absolute disaster. What a shame. It was a lovely horse. Um, what year was it that um, you rode Hello Dandy in the Grand National? Because I've got a story to tell you about that. Have you? Uh, <laughs> um, Hello Dandy. I'll have, have to have a look at my book. I can't remember. I mean, he'd won it. The, um, the year before, the year before, with Neil Doughty, and, 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 and got the ride in it. Uh, and unfortunately, I fell at the first. You did, um, which was a I was so unlucky. But a lot of good horses, a lot of horses that have won the Grand Master have fallen at the first. You know, uh, um, can't remember exactly what year it was. I'd have to have a look for you. I can't believe it. I was actually um, I was at Twickenham watching England play. Um, it was either Ireland or Scotland, and I was quite drunk to be honest. And um, <laughs> they, they showed the Grand National on the screen at Twickenham. And I couldn't, and obviously being a big, big fan of yours, there I was tanked up. And then, you know, hello, Dandy's down at the first. I thought, oh, I can't blinking well believe this, you know. Uh, uh, so you didn't really have a lot, a lot of luck in the Grand National for a long time, did you? No, I had about 15 or 16 rides. Um, and the best ride I ever had, unfortunately, was 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 only Sunny Bay. That's right. Um, that had won, that had won a few beautiful races on him, um, and he had twelve stone, I think. Um, I gave him a great ride again. I dropped him last and mm. settled him and went around the inside all the way. Um, I'd won the nineteen ninety seven Hennessy 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 on it. Um, Andrew Cohen was a was a big owner for Charlie Brooks. Yeah. Um, but then to to ride him in the Grand National and finish second was a was a great result. But it's just it's a real shame um, that I couldn't win it. Unfortunately, he was second the year before, wasn't he? As well. Yes, um, with a lot lighter weight. Jamie Osborne had rode him, hadn't he? 
Yeah, I think that was um, Mr. Frisk's, Mr. Frisk's race when he broke the, the course record. Was it? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Earth, Earth Summit. Yeah, Carl Llewellyn, yeah. Carl, Carl, Carl Llewellyn, <laughs> he beat us about 11 lengths. I mean, he's, a, he's a, still a very, very, very close friend of mine. Um, he was a, a brilliant jockey. Um, he was an apprentice jockey, not apprentice, a conditional jockey when he was at Jim Hall's. Um, but he'd won a load of big races. He'd won the Scottish Grand National thing, but his weight was very low. Um, 4th of April, 1988, Sunny Bay. Um, I really enjoyed it. Gave it a brilliant ride. But I was so unlucky that Earth Summit had a lightweight and um, it was nice. Carl Llewellyn, that was his second Grand National that he'd, that he'd run. I had 12 stone. He had 10 stone, 10. A lot of weight. And mm. that's what, that's what, that's what, cost me getting beat by him unfortunately so going back in history um it's so probably the time other than charlie brooks i loved it when you were charlie brooks uh the time yeah. the time i um I, I enjoyed was when you were with david Ells, ellsworth and um i can remember um one one sunday in wing canton true story this i don't uh, yeah. you you um you had six rides at wing canton and uh I, 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 I bet on every race, obviously, and every single horse came second. Uh, yeah. And I think one of the horses you rode was called W Six Times. W Six Times. I think that's I think that's what it was called. I think that was Kinson Horse. Was he? I can't remember. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just I'm just having a little look here. I'm just having a little look here. January 1990, Haydock, right? I won a race on a horse called Mrs Muck, the Nigel Twist. Yeah, no, I remember Davis. that. I remember that horse. Yeah. Amazing, and then I had a I had a double. I rode on Bank View, which was a champion. Her Nigel Tinkler, conditional uh, camp camp. Uh, and Nigel Tinkler. I mean, he's been a friend of mine for years and years and years. That was absolutely brilliant. January nineteen ninety, and then afterwards for David Ellsworth, I won the Jim Ford on Cavie's Clown. Um, he lost Cavie's Clown in the end. Uh, went to Jenny Pittman. I That's think. right. And that was, but that was Win Canton. In 1990, they were they were they were unbelievable winners. Mrs. Muck, Bankview, um, and David Ellsworth, um, which which was which, which was a pleasure. I remember one um, one season when you were a bit out of um, favour, uh, and there was one one you had one really good ride um, up to Christmas, and it was a horse called Major Inquiry. Um, Major Inquiry, yeah. Yeah, and I may I think it was um, I remember watching. I think it was maybe on New Year's Day even, um, and it was a it was a big novice race at Cheltenham and major inquiry uh, won again for you. I think that was your fifth winner of the season. Only five winners at, up to January the first, and then um, I think you had about an, you had an about twenty in the in January after that. It, and uh, I always remember again, I used to buy the Racing Post every day and obviously follow all your rides. Um, and there was a, there was a trainer called Owen O'Neill. Owen O'Neill. Owen uh, O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, and he put yeah, you up on a horse. Lovely, um, lovely blow. In the first week in January, um, and I remember the racing post were going on about this because obviously you you sort of gone through this terrible barren period, and then all of a sudden, um, everything yeah. you rode won, sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, my dad my dad was training. Norman was training eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety. I rode a few winners for him. But when I got the job for Charlie Brooks. It was on February 1991. Um, I went down and had an interview with him and he told me um, that I could ride a lot of good horses for him. And, and you know, he had a beautiful, beautiful yard. Um, well, Fred so Winter's was yard, wasn't it? Fred Winter's yard. I got a very, very, very <laughs> lucky job to, to get a job with him. I mean, I won the... I was about, only about 10 or 12 tried I got him or something like that I won the Charlie Hall chase at Weatherby on Celtic shot he'd won it the year before I think with Peter Skewden that's Moore. right and Peter Skewden was more or less his stable jockey but I think he'd gone yeah. to Martin Pike he has I mean, Peter Skewden was, was a, a champion jockey for a lot of years but to ride for Charlie Brooks and do what I did for Charlie Brooks was just, was just absolutely unbelievable some of the really good horses like the Cheltenham winners, my young man, um, a spy, yeah, black, black humor. humor, black humor, um, couldn't be better, Bo Sunny Bay, Bacaro, couldn't be better, Bocaro. Sounder, Sounder of Valley, Sounder of Valley, couldn't yeah, be couldn't, couldn't be better. Won the Fiestas Chase in Ireland, mm. which was absolutely unbelievable. 
One thing I yeah. thought, sorry, just to drag you back a bit, um, I think your first big winner for Charlie Brooks was actually the Italian champion hurdle on Bocaro. Bocaro, I don't think it was one of the first. I think it was, first, actually. I think it needs to go look in your book there. I'm going to take you on there. 13th of April, 1991, Bacaro, Italian champion hurdle at yeah. San Siro. Uh, that yeah. was, that was, Remember it well. That was abs- oh, absolutely amazing to win on him. Um, he was a very, 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 very good horse. Yeah, he ran a lot in France as well, didn't he? Yeah, I went to on him. Um, I rode quite a few winners um, in France for Lord Lloyd Webber. We used to go down and stay his house in the south of France. It was absolutely amazing. I can't remember the name of the horse. Can you remember? I mean, I hope this didn't upset me in France, but they said I'd finished second in a handicap hurdle. Did you write that in my book or not? Right, so I was getting a shower. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, Lord Lloyd, Lloyd Lloyd Webber had gone home. Um, he left, getting a shower. Then an, an ex-friend of mine, sorry, not an ex-friend of mine, an ex-English jockey who was working in France for a lot of years, he came into the shower. I was naked while I was having a shower, and he said to me, "He said, Bradus, ask the um, ask the French people to, to have a look at the photograph of the race." I says, "What for?" He says, "Just tell them to have a look." So, oh, I got out of the shower, put a towel around me. I had uh-huh. nothing on my chest. I went into the water. I said, this is amazing. This is in my book. You should read it. Um, and I asked him, I said, could I please have a look at the uh, the photograph at the, 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 uh, the end of it, you know, the winning? Yeah. And they said, they said, what for? I said, oh, I just want it for me, for me, for me owner to show him. Um, I think, funny enough, I don't think the Lloyd Lloyd, Lloyd, Lloyd Lloyd was there. Anyway, 10 minutes later, they changed the result. I'd won it. Can you believe that? Was that Padre Mio, maybe? Nope, it wasn't Padre Mio. Carolo? Um, can you think of three uh, Lloyd Webber horses? Because he owned Black, Black Humour, didn't he, to start with? Yeah, it was... Um, no, he didn't own Black Humour. I don't think. But anyway, I can't remember the name of the horse. Charlie Brooks trained it. Um, and they changed, they, they changed the results. They put me as a winner. If, if I hadn't have asked for the photograph, they put the French horse as the winner and me as second. Can you? I just can't get over that. I wish I'd wrote that down and remembered it was a lot of years ago. I mean, I've been retired 20, 22 years now, you see. Um, so I can't remember exactly. I will forgive I you. Mean, I, can, I, can, I can remember the race, and but I can't remember the horse's name. Um, I can't remember the date. I might have I'm a look sure. in your book. <laughs> yeah, have a look, look, look at your book. So you and Charlie Brooks yeah. must have been like chalk and cheese, old Etonian and Weatherby boy. Um, well, Charlie Brooks was a lot younger than me, but um, I just he had some lovely horses. Um, I, I used to love love riding for him. Yeah, I, I think I was right. Yeah, I think you owe me an Hang apology here, Graham. Garolo, Garolo, Can Saint Mare, third of January, nineteen ninety six. I reckon that's the race. Look. So Garolo won. Ah, there you go. There you go. January the third, nineteen ninety six. Garolo. Yeah, thank you. Some air, France. Yeah. I drove yeah. Padre. I drove Padre Mayo the night before. It was definitely Garolo. Well done. Yes. See, I could do mastermind Lord, on you. Lord Lloyd Webber's. Well yeah, done. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> I won the I won the Marlborough Cup on Sharid. Yeah, Ian yeah, that was Ball, that was that was quite something, wasn't it? For, for Ian Baldwin. And I see you rode in a you rode in a snow May. race, didn't you? Or something, or a water race, a snow water race. Or something. When I was in in Germany. Germany, yeah. Yeah, Germany. Water race. <laughs> water race yeah. that. I mean I, <laughs> when I when I look at all of these things, the people that I rode winners for, Ian Baldwin, Charlie Edgerton, Kim Bailey, Nigel Tinkler. <laughs> this thing that David, David Cantillon, John Jenkins. I wrote, I wrote for a lot of people, Tony Mullins, Tommy Taft, Nicky Henderson, I didn't ride a winner for him, but I wrote a few for him. Aidan O'Brien, I wrote a winner for him in Ireland, which was... Which so was Hotel absolutely... Manila, was it? Hotel Manila, yeah. February 1995, Hotel Manila, Aidan O'Brien, left us down. Um, then I got, I got, you know, I got a stable jockey for Paul Nichols. Nichols you did. Seymour Indians. Um, 
See more Indians. I rode some really nice winners for him. Unfortunately, his owner, his main owner, was an absolute super zealous and brilliant horse. He, he fell out with me because he said I gave a horse a bad ride. Yeah. And he wouldn't let me he look, wouldn't let me ride it again. So I only rode for Paul Nichols for one year. It was, it was a real disaster that I didn't keep his I'd, I'd done nothing wrong. I just I just pulled this horse up at Cheltenham because yeah. it was either the ground was too quick or there was something wrong with him, but it was a it was a wee bit of disaster. Um, Henry de Bromed, I wrote two winners for him. Commercial artist. Fisher Seal and Bishop's Hall. Oh, was it? Yeah. He was yeah, commercial April artist then. That must April 93, Punchy Stamp. Yeah. What about this? Another, I won, I won this race, this award. April 93, the Aintree Martel Hurl yeah, on Morley Street. Morley Street. Yeah. He was an absolute, he'd won it two or three times before. Loads of good jockeys had rode it. Um, but I got the, I, I gave him an absolutely brilliant ride and got an award um, for, for winning on him that day. It was, it was, it was a miracle. Loved it. But riding for Henry, Henry de Bromed in Ireland was really good. Harry de Bromed's dad was, was, just, was just unbelievable. Um, September 93, Baccaro at Otoy, Charlie Brooks. Um, I rode winners for Tipper Mullins, Mouse Morris. Yeah, um, Mouse Morris, that's Paul, Belvederean and all that sort of lot, wasn't it? Yeah, Paul Nichols, 1995 Hotel Millilla for Aidan O'Brien at Leopardstown. Oh, here's another good horse I won twice on February 95, Garrison Savannah for Jenny Pittman in Canton. He ended up winning the Grand National, didn't he? He won the Gold Cup, uh, didn't he? In, um... Sorry, he won the Gold Cup, not the Grand National, <laughs> Garrison Savannah, yeah. Um, Kim Bailey, um, Ian Bolden, I rode a, a winner for the Queen Mother. Ian Baldwin um, and then I was obviously stable jockey for Jim Old for a couple of years then I lost that job as well but back in March 1996 can you remember that story on my book when they rode Collier Bay oh, he's, getting, he's, he's running away now you see so um, just, yeah. just this, this is one of the, probably the best story of all in here so um, yeah. there's a horse called Alderbrook um, that absolutely was owned, yes. uh, trained by Kim <laughs> Bailey that yes, had been written by ride him. Norman Williamson to win the champion hurdle the year before. Uh, Graham yeah. got the ride, and he was supposed to turn up for schooling at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. I can't remember what. It was 9 or 10 o'clock anyway. Um, and Mr. Bradley got drunk and didn't wake well, up. I was No, I did wake up. I was supposed <laughs> to ride him out the next morning in Lambourne at 10 o'clock, mm. right? Um, so there was a party... There was a party that night, a really late night, near Newbury. Um, and I stayed there. I was swimming. I was drinking. I was very, very, very drunk. I didn't get to bed till about 1.30. Right? But then my wife got up in the morning at 7 o'clock. She had a job. And she went. And I set my alarm on my telephone. To at nine o'clock to wake up at nine o'clock, then I'd get my riding gear on, and then go down to Lambourne School at ten o'clock. But anyway, we had an electricity thing finished, went off in the in our village, and because I was drunk and tired, I'd never. I just kept sleeping. Didn't wake up till about twenty past ten. Um, so I rang Kim Bailey up, and he said, "Where are you?" I said, "Oh, so I'm sorry. I said I've only just woken up." Um, but he, his owner was there. There was loads of television people mm. there as well. They'd already schooled him. So he said, don't bother even coming. And the owner was very upset. Can't blame him for that. And I lost the ride on this, which was a, a nightmare. He put... Um, Richard Dunwoody. Richard Dunwoody. Put Richard Dunwoody back on him. Uh, so I lost him. I'd won on Collier Bay a few months before at Sandown. Yeah, I remember that race, but, yeah. But then but then Jimmy Osborne, Jamie Osborne had won on him in Ireland and he was going to ride him and he chose to ride another horse. My Silve. My Silve, there you go. And you'd also ridden My Silve, I think, once. I, I rode My Silve to yeah. finish third in the champion of the year before. Mm -hmm. I was still, I mean, still a very friendly with Jim Oldham. He was a brilliant trainer. But riding Collier Bay then, the ground was going to be too fast for him. I That's think. right. And then it started raining, didn't it? It did. Well, like, we played in a charity golf thing the night before, um, but he'd been declared 
Jamie Osborne had declared on, on what is it? My silver. Um, yeah. My silver. Is it about 11 o'clock, half 11 or something? But then from 12 o'clock, when we were playing golf, it started raining all night in the morning. So the <laughs> ground went really, really soft and Collier Bay uh, enjoyed it. Um, Jamie Osborne was at the front at the second last and mm. I went upsides in. And turning for home, I went in front and ended up winning them. And I gave it a great ride. It was absolutely brilliant. I was a little bit lucky. Well, I was very, very lucky to uh, to get the ride on Collier Bay. But um, the horse I was supposed to ride for this second, which, he was, did. <laughs> which was amazing. That's yeah, in think, the book as well. I think that was one of your better rides. It's, 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 it's always difficult when you ride, you know, because you, you sort of um, sort of took it up with um, going around the bend, didn't you? And then you scooted away. Um but it was, he won very decisively, and Alderbrook was sort of struggling to catch him up, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. I got told by Michael Dickinson when I was very young, right, to go either on the inside or the outside of race courses, especially when there's lots and lots and lots of runners, because horses can fall in front of you, horses can hit you, can stop you. So I used to do that all the time. He said, and the ground was always better on the inside on the outside and I used to do that a lot um, Simon Reason in the Irish National yeah. I, I, Irish Grand National and he was a novice I went on the wide outside all the way when you go around a bend around a turn you've got to you've got to go in a little bit so you're not yeah. so you're not giving yourself too many too many miles of length yeah. on the outside but then on the straights of race courses inside and outside that's what I used to do all the time Um Collier Bay, I was, I was more or less upsides in front all the way in second. Um, and when I, when I hit the front after the second last, um, when I passed Jamie Osborne, I stayed on the inside rails and I kicked on around the bend. And it, was, uh, it, it was a great win. So what, was, what was this all about? <laughs> you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you finish and you're doing this? What was that? That was that was that was that well, something to do with the clock, or was that the Leeds United thing? No, 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 no. Leeds United, marching on together. I've always been a Leeds United. <laughs> um, I just, I just absolutely love Leeds United. I always have done. You know, my dad used to be a used to be a supporter, and I used to go to Ellen Road all the time. Um, when I won, when I won on Morley Street, um, and I passed the post, I knew. My very, very close friend, Eddie Gray, was in the stands at the front there. And when I went past, the television was looking at us all. I went like that. Mm. Lees, 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 marching on together. I used to do that all the time, Eddie Gray. So, I think we must go back. So we had this discussion on the phone last week, but um, I actually think the, your ride on Morley Street was better than Johnny Frankham's ride on Sea Pigeon, personally. But I don't agree with that. Um, I mean, the Morley Street was a very, very, very good ride. But John Franklin on Steve Pigeon was it was it was just a miracle. I'm telling you, it was so much confidence and his balance and sitting there and sitting there and sitting there for such a long time. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. But wow. my ride again, there, there were two brilliant, brilliant, brilliant rides. So <laughs> um, again, as I've said, I'm not in agreement. Yeah, there, there were two great rides. So. Um... How did you get to be friendly with people like Steve McManaman and Robbie Fowler, etc.? How did that all come about? We Anthony, A.P. McCoy, he introduced me to him. Um, A.P., when he came over from Ireland, he stopped in my house for, for a couple of weeks. A lot of people did that. A lot of Irish jockeys did that in my house because I was, I was more or less on my own. Uh, but then I got married. There was me and the missus there. We didn't have any kids. We had a four-bedroom house. Um, and A.P. came and stopped with us. Um, he's still a very close friend of mine. We Anthony, that was his nickname. Yeah, I seen I seen him ride his first winner in Ireland. He was just unbelievable. Um, but he um, he recommended me to them to um, Steve McManaman and Robbie Fowler. Um, and when I'd retired, being a jockey and I was a bloodstock agent, I started looking for some horses and I bought some um, really German nice ones, horses yeah. in in Germany for him. Um, and they all. Every single, I think there's six of them, nearly every single one of them won first time out. They, they liked having a nice gamble. Um, Awan Tala was the first, and he won a few races. That's a lovely and horse called Seabold, wasn't it? A very, very good horse called Seabold won mm. a lot of big races. Um, another horse called Samon, Bernardo, Bernando, 
I we sold a few horses, but it was it was brilliant going to the races and going to Aintree and, and being with them. They were they were two they're two lovely. They're still two very good friends of mine. Um, it was it was just it was just unbelievable. Macaron Macaron Growler was the was the name. Gary McAllister was fifty a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, I think. Are you still and, friendly uh, with him? Sent, sent, sent him a message. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's a, he's an absolute superstar. And Robbie Fowler as well. Two two legends, you know. When uh, Steve McManaman went from Liverpool to Real Madrid, myself and AP McCoy went in a in a in a fly in a what is it in a aeroplane. <laughs> um, went to see the game and he won. It was it was it was just absolutely brilliant. Loved it. I find it really. Quite, I, I wouldn't imagine you and AP McCoy being great friends, but he obviously loves you, doesn't he? Well, we were we were friends for a lot of years. He was never a drinker. Him, he was just always dedicated. He was a lot taller than me. He was heavy, but he used to do ten stone. Um, he was so 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 dedicated, but he was he was just absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, he, he's, again, his his balance, his rhythm, his timing, his intelligence, his uh, his confidence. And he was, you know, he was one of the world's uh, probably. I mean, John John Frankham, you see, because of his rhythm, balance, time, and it, for me, I think he's one of the best that I've ever seen. Yeah, I agree. AP McCoy, AP McCoy was very, very, very nearly as good as him. I think two of the best chuckies I've ever seen. Genius. Very different. They were different, definitely. Um, Frankham was more. Was more still and more balanced, but AP McCoy was just, just we Anthony was just absolutely magnificent, world class, as good as you'll ever see. <laughs> well, he sort of threw everything at the horse, didn't he? That's how I would describe it. Um, I don't know about throwing everything at the horse, but he was, he was, you know, even if it was a selling hurdle or a Cheltenham Gold Cup or a Grand National, he did everything the same. He wanted to win everything. You know, I was really friendly with his with his dad. I didn't see his mum very much. I've seen her now and again when I went to Ireland. But all his brothers and sisters, I used to see them at, at Aintree and at Cheltenham. Um, lovely, lovely, lovely family. Superstar. His dad's, a, his dad's an absolute lovely bloke as well. Excellent. So, of course, you've, um, you were, uh, you've got uh, three... Uh, siblings haven't you two sisters and a brother is that right um i lost my mother breast cancer she was 44 i lost my older sister mandy mo mandy bradley mm. she she was breast cancer she was 44 as well i lost my dad norman when he was 72 so i've got my younger sister jackie and my older brother gary they both live in england um that's the only two I've got left, unfortunately. Are you very close? Um, we always have been, yeah. Jackie and Gazzo, um, they're both working still. Hopefully they're going to come and see us in France when all this COVID-19 comes through. But yeah, we're very, very close. Yeah, I think, um, so we've got uh, Graham's, Graham's book here, um, which is... <laughs> I don't think that must have come out 15 years ago, did it? A long time ago now. I think it, it was, it was, I think it was 2000, so it was 22 years ago, right? And we sold lots and lots and lots, and I got loads of messages. People absolutely love it, right? It's a great book. And I do, uh, yeah, I do a lots of things on Facebook. I would like, I would love to have written another one about when I retire, but I can't, can't do one, unfortunately. But anyway. Why not? So sold well. We sold lots and lots and lots and lots, right? But now on Facebook, people are asking me if they can have a book. Um, it cost me a lot of money to post it from France back to England. So when I come back to England, I sign it and I post it for a fiver over to them. So there's lots of people now, 22 years later on, that I'm still signing books and and uh, and giving them, which which they're, they're really enjoying. It's a it's a really nice book. Um, Obviously, I don't really like to, to say it very much, but the fallout that I had with the Jockey Club and the BHA, I would like to write it in a book exactly, exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But um, but they just, I just, I just, I just can't do it. Um, 
Why is that? Steve Taylor. Steve Steve Taylor's. He was brilliant at helping me writing it. His wife's not very well at the moment. She's in a hospital. Fingers crossed she's going to be okay. Um, but um, I'd like to. I'd like to tell the world that I went to the, the jockey club and I lost that appeal. And I went to the high court. Yeah. And then I went to I went to something else, right? Not the High Court, the next Court of Appeal, right? Mm. Which I got told would help me a lot. I'd lost already paying legal fees. I'd lost about three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So I went to this. Can't remember. Not the, the Court of Appeal or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. There was the, there was three senior judges. And we gave our evidence in the morning, told them all about it. And the middle major, the older judge, stood up in the afternoon. And you'll never believe in a million years what he said. He says, listen, we don't even want to hear from the jockey club. We can't go against the jockey mm-hmm. club. They're the professionals. They know everything. We don't know everything about them. So we don't want to hear their case and we'll we'll see you after lunch to pay the fees. I was nearly ill. I was nearly sick. I couldn't mm, believe. Yeah, sure. I couldn't believe the jockey club. The jockey club could do anything, anything, anything they wanted in life. Mm. And the courts, the high court appeal, they said, they said they just couldn't go against him. So I ended up losing a lot of money. Nearly, nearly half a million quid in cash, which is... I'm not saying it's ruined my life, but it really, really, really has. It's been a disaster for me, an absolute disaster. You know, the the jockey club, the BHA, they wouldn't let me be a trainer. No. They wouldn't they wouldn't let me be an assistant trainer to David Ellsworth. They wouldn't let me be a jockey's agent. I had a horse in Ireland running with Joe Lyons. They mm. wouldn't let me he wouldn't let me run it in England. They literally, literally, literally wouldn't let me do anything. Um which was a you know an absolute disaster. I'd like I'd like to write another book about, well, about what had happened. But well, I mean, I'm 61 years old now, and that's why you've got to write um, it. Well, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about it, but it's probably I'm probably too old. Uh, I'll help you do it, Graham. I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Would you? Okay, of course. Be very, yeah, very, 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 would be a, a bit of an honour. Be an honour, Lord Lord Bradley, obviously. I mean, it's been a, it's been a lovely conversation with you, and it's it's lovely talking about all these all these owners, all these trainers, all these good horses that I've rode, all the big winners that I've had. Um, one person I haven't mentioned at all now is a chap called David Metcalf, who's a friend of mine from Leeds. Right, I bought him a horse when I was a. When I've, I've still got Barts of Bloodstock Limited. I bought him a horse called Vicious Circle. Oh, Two that's, weeks yeah, be, that's your touch before one. it won be, before yeah. it won the Evo. I mean, he was an absolute superstar. Was 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 well, he still is a, an absolute superstar, David Metcalf. Um, he had something wrong with his business, and hopefully, he's going to get back. Um, but again, like you say, I've, I've mentioned everybody um, that I know. Even even in France now, I've still got back to something to have, and I'm starting talking to a few a few jockeys over here. Um, James Leavely, Felix De Giles, um, the Laurent Barberon who works on the TV, Nicholas Clement, the, the trainer, uh, George Haynes moved over here, and Thierry Dumas, Richard Venn, who's an English agent, who's a French agent, Richard Hobson, who's a trainer. I'm trying to get in touch with them and go and see them. I have to drive miles and miles and miles to see horses. Um, but hopefully I'm going to try and buy a few or sell a few really good French horses to mm. England and Ireland and maybe it's Dubai and Australia. But that's that's what I'm working at at the moment. Okay, Graham. So um, I think we could carry on for hours, but we ought to um, to bring this first interview to a conclusion. Um, just, just in closing, uh, I was telling Graham before we started the interview today that uh, my good friend John Joe O'Neill um, sent me several uh, messages yesterday while he was driving to the races to pass on to yeah. Graham. So, uh, John Joe, uh, so just just to put it into perspective, uh, John Joe rode Wayward Lad in your Gold Cup, Bragorn Gold Cup, when he was third. 
And then, of course, you rode Wayward Lad in the Dawn Run Gold Cup where he caught you on the line. Um, and I've yeah. never, and obviously the reason I love John Joe and all the, um, is because he rode my favorite horse of all time, as you know, in the Sea Pigeon. And uh, John Joe also, when he became a trainer, he put you up a few times. Um, so you won yeah. four or five races for John Joe. Um, his, I, and uh, anyway, so John Joe basically says that you were a legend in the in the changing rooms. Basically, great bloke to be with, um, helped the mood. Uh, thinks you're one of the most stylish jockeys in history. Um, top bloke. Um, and he, he he had a bit of a crow about the fact that he knew that Wayward Lad wouldn't stay up the hill because he'd ridden it the year before. So uh, thanks to John Joe for that. Yeah, John, John Joe's an absolute superstar. I used to love his first wife and his second wife now, Jackie's. She's absolutely beautiful. She's wonderful. His young jockey, John Joe O'Neill Jr. I've never really met him. He's absolutely fabulous. I'm trying to find a couple of horses for him or something, but... You know, when he when he was when he won the Cheltenham Gold Cup on Dawn Run, and I was second on Wayward Lad, I was I led right until the end. Yeah, I know. Killed me. I con- I congratulated him. I mean, I was absolutely gutted. I finished second three times in three Cheltenham Gold Cups. But John Joe O'Neill was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant jockey. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful trainer, and he's a lovely man. I still get on well with him now. Okay, so on that note, uh, thank you, Graham Bradley. Um, wish you all the best for the future, and we'll do our best to help you. Um, and for those of you who um, who want to catch the radio, we'll be playing uh, Graham's songs um, just after this. Thanks, Graham. Lovely. That will be brilliant. Thank you very much. Educate, entertain, enjoy. You're listening to Aspen Waits Radio. 